So in this lecture, we're going to talk about all the different fungi that can cause disease. So if all the bacteria that we talked about that cause disease and all the viruses that we talked about that cause disease and even the ones that didn't cause disease, there's a whole bunch of other things that can cause disease as well. Now, there are over 100,000 species of fungi. Luckily, there are less than 200 that cause disease. In this PowerPoint, we're going to go through what is medical mycology, what are the true human pathogens, what are some of the opportunistic fungal pathogens, and then a whole bunch of the different ones that pretty much are growing on your skin, the visual ones, the superficial, the cutaneous, the subcutaneous skin diseases. So we're going to start off first with what is medical mycology. Well, it's the diagnosis, the management, and the prevention of fungal diseases. Anything that has that MYC in it means fungus. So mycology really is the study of fungus. A mycosis is a fungal disease. Now, fungal diseases, unfortunately, can be very difficult to diagnose because their signs, their signs and symptoms are often missed or they're misinterpreted as usually a bacteria or a viral infection. And they're now becoming resistant to a lot of our antifungal drugs, just like bacteria are. Now the spread of mycoses. So fungi and spores are everywhere. They're in the air, they're in the soil, they're on different organisms, they are everywhere. Now how we pick up the various fungal spores and the fungi is usually inhalation. That's the top one. Otherwise, any kind of trauma, if there's open wound, they can get in. And then some can get in through ingestion, and we'll talk about some that can cause problems by eating various fungi. Now luckily, most of these are not contagious. If you get a fungal infection, it's rare to spread it to someone else. They're mostly picked up by inhaling them or trauma by some type of an environmental source. The only exception to that is the ones that live on your skin. Those can be spread skin to skin or direct contact. Now the times that we see people that have, um, or if there's an epidemic, an outbreak of a fungal infection, it's normally because a large number of individuals has, have all had the same environmental exposure. So if there was fungal spores in a particular building or an air conditioning unit, it doesn't mean it's getting spread person to person, it just means a large number of people were all exposed to that exact same fungal spore. Now, fungal infections are not reportable, so we can't track them. They're not required to be reportable. So we don't track them. So although we know where a lot of cases seem to be, we're not tracking them because they're not generally spread from person to person. Now, there are true fungal pathogens that are out there. And that means that they will cause disease, even in healthy individuals. Now, how bad you get an infection can depend on your immune system, but even healthy individuals can pick up one of these true fungal pathogens. Now, luckily there's only four true human pathogens and we're gonna go over them. And unfortunately they're all endemic or located in the Americas, whether North America or South America. Then there are opportunistic fungi, which means if you are immunocompromised, had some type of medical procedure done. I was going to say any of these would increase your risk. A medical procedure, a medical therapy, some type of pre-existing disease, and even lifestyle factors would all put you at an increased risk of some type of opportunistic fungi. Now, the spore dose and the immune system can affect any severity of a fungal infection. If you get a large quantity of spores and you're immunocompromised, it would be the worst case scenario. If you have a healthy immune system and you get very few spores in your body, you generally have a very less severe case of the fungal disease, even to the asymptomatic uh, classification. Now, diagnosing someone for a fungal infection, the patient's history is the most important because a lot of fungal diseases are not routinely tested for. And most of the time, as we go through some of the signs and symptoms of these fungal diseases, they resemble a lot of bacteria or viral infections. And because viral and bacterial infections are generally more common than fungal infections, we generally just start to assume ah, it's a bacteria, it's a fungal and we don't normally test right away for a fungal disease, unless it's extremely obvi obvious based on signs and symptoms, uh, or if the bacteria or, or viral 
uh, prescriptions or drugs aren't working, then we start to look at other alternatives. So knowing a patient's history could be the first clue. So those that are going into the nursing program, uh, nurses sometimes are the first ones that are listening to the patients talk. They're hearing their stories and they're starting to pick up on clues that they say. If they've traveled to somewhere that has a high de- uh kind of a high rate of certain fungal infections, if they're pre-existing conditions, even if they have birds. Birds actually put you at an increased risk of a lot of fungal infections. So sometimes just listening and getting a little bit of patient's history can kind of clue you in. Maybe it's not a bacteria or a virus. Maybe it is a fungal infection. Now when they diagnose, because there are lots of bacteria in the human body, we want to eliminate that. And so we do have an auger It's a selective auger that inhibits bacterial growth. However, it allows fungi to grow. And so we can take patient samples and eliminate bacterial growth, and then they'll show us if there are fungi present. Then underneath the microscope, we can look for various spores. We can look for any type of hyphae. We can look for specific structures of a fungi. Now, other techniques, they could just look really for those little fungal spores, those fungal cells. A lot of times, especially with the skin scraping, they can dissolve the keratin in the skin and they're gonna look to see what's remaining. They're gonna look for those fungal spores. Now treating a fungal disease, well, they're getting more and more difficult to treat. They're becoming resistant to a lot of our antifungals. They themselves are, have a resistance to our immune response. So as our immune system tries to fight it off, they already are naturally resistant to our immune system response. And they're also similar biochemically to us. They are a eukaryotic organism. So when we treat them as we're trying to kill eukaryotic cells, it could cause damage to our own cells which can lead to a lot of side effects. A lot of times with antifungal drugs, there's headaches, there's rashes, there's upset digestive system issues. We end up with a lot of side effects. Now, one particular drug that's used quite often is called amphotericin B. Now, it targets a structure called ergosterol that's found in the cell membrane of a fungal spore. So here's the cell membrane. It's got your phospholipid bilayer but these purple structures is the ergosterol. And it's a lipid found in the cell membrane of fungi. However, our cells have a similar lipid. It's not the exact same, but we have a similar lipid found in our cell membranes called cholesterol. Now, amphotericin B recognizes ergosterol. Anywhere ergosterol is, it inserts a pore or it inserts a channel. AKA, it puts a hole where there's not supposed to be a hole, which, If you've got holes in your cell membrane, you can't regulate what goes in, you can't regulate what goes out, and ultimately the cell dies. However, amphotericin B can sometimes accidentally recognize our cholesterol as ergosterol, and it inserts pores or channels in our cells, leading to some of these harmful side effects. So although it is our best antifungal medicine we have, it can cause some serious side effects. Now, for opportunistic infections, one that usually, if you're immunocompromised, it's usually a two-step treatment. They usually give you a high-dose antifungal to decrease the number of fungi in the body. But because high doses of antifungal can lead to harmful side effects, we need to get rid of as many fungi as possible. But then we put you on a low dose for a long period of time to prevent any new infections and new growth of that fungus from taking place. Now, sometimes the nickname for the amphotericin B is sometimes called amphoterable just because it does have some of those toxic side effects. Now, it would be nice if we just had a vaccine for all of these. However, they're difficult to develop because their cells are similar to our cells. We're all eukaryotic cells. We do have some vaccines, though. They're weakened versions of the vir- of the virus of the fungi, so they can't cause disease. And so we do have vaccines against a couple of the the coccidioids, the blastomycoses, and some candida. Uh, And we're working on more. They're just harder to develop. And so we're, we're getting there slowly. Now, the true pathogens, there are four of them that we're gonna talk about. And again, these are gonna cause disease even in the healthiest individuals. 
Now the four that we're going to talk about, which are going to be my next slides coming up, the histoplasma, blastomyces, blastomyces coccidioids, and paracoccidioids. Now all of them are picked up through inhalation. So we acquire the spores into our lungs, then they get into our bloodstream, and they can spread throughout the body, causing fungal infections anywhere in the body. Now all four of these pathogenic fungi are all dimorphic. The di part means two, morph means form, so they have two forms to them. Out in the environment, these fungi grow their spores on these long strands that look like branches called hyphae. However, and those spores get released and that's what we breathe in. Once those spores gets into the human body, they reproduce by budding. So they have two forms to them. They're either gonna produce spores coming off these long stringy hyphae or they're gonna produce additional spores by budding. It really is temperature dependent. In the environment, when it's less than 30 degrees Celsius, they're always gonna reproduce by hyphae. When it gets to that warmer body temperature, it reverts over and starts to reproduce by budding. Now the first one, the histoplasma, the most common histoplasma that causes issues in humans is the histoplasma capsulatum, and it is the most common fungal pathogen that affects humans, whether you realized it or not. Now, the fungus itself is generally found in moist soils that have a high nitrogen content, which usually comes from bird and bat feces. So in caves or anywhere there's a large concentration of birds, that fecal matter increases the nitrogen content, and this, fungal, this fungus loves it. Now we pick it up again through inhalation. We inhale the spores, they get into the lungs, they can travel throughout the blood and the lymph, affecting different parts of the body. Now where it's found, found in the United States, we find it in Africa and we found it in South America. So I always ask the question, you know, is it around here? Everyone's like, oh, not really. Uh, there are cases around here. Although we're not technically, you know, in this little pinkish area we're pretty close and so there are cases here around the lacrosse area uh it's just not a lot of cases you're going to have a higher rate of cases down in the ohio river valley uh it likes the soil in the ohio river valley but there are cases around here now most of the time again it is the most common fungal pathogen that affects humans and most of the time because it is very predominant it's asymptomatic or causes minor symptoms, a little coughing, nothing too bad. However, if you have clinical histoplasmosis, which means you're gonna have suffer, suffer side effects enough that it would take you to the clinic, one of them is called chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis. It's affecting the lungs the most. It can cause severe coughing, I see some of my typos, severe coughing, bloody sputum, night sweats, it can cause weight loss, now, just symptoms alone, severe coughing, night sweats, weight, lo weight loss, blood change, sputum, a lot of times the chronic pulmonary histoplasmosis is often mistaken for tuberculosis. They have very similar symptoms to each other, which again, a lot of times they will treat for tuberculosis based on symptoms, and if it doesn't work, then they start looking at alternatives. It can also, as again, it spreads throughout the body with that blood or the lymph, it can affect the skin and it can cause chronic cutaneous histoplasmosis when you're gonna have skin lesions all over the body that can last for months. It can also cause systemic histoplasmosis, which means it's affecting various body systems. It usually affects first the liver and the spleen, usually more in the highest immunocompromised individuals, those that have AIDS. And the systemic histoplasmosis has, it can be fatal in a lot of individuals that are in the AIDS stage of HIV. And then it can also affect the eyes. It can cause inflammation of the eyes. Here's some actual fungi growing at the back of the eyes. So when you go to the doctor and they look in your eyes, they look in at the back of your eyes, and this is just an example of some of these, these fungi growing in your eyes. It's gonna cause inflammation and redness of the eyes. Um, it can go away on its own, but it's gonna cause your eyes to look very inflamed and it's gonna be painful and your eyes are gonna kind of feel itchy. Now, when they do diagnosis, yes, all the symptoms are gonna help. They're gonna start to you know, lead you to a histoplasmosis infection,
but they do need to look at the actual fungus itself. So they're going to look at the yeast. They're usually going to get a sample from the sputum if you're having lung infections, a skin scraping. Um, if they think it's made it into the nervous system, they can do a sample from your cerebral spinal fluid. Treatment, if you're healthy, a lot of times it can go away on its own. Otherwise, they're going to give you amphotericin B or a weaker antifungal called ketoconazole. It's usually if you have milder symptoms, that's not going away. Our second true pathogen is blastomyces dermatitis. It causes the disease blastomycosis. We find this particular fungus southeastern United States, all the way north up into Canada, and yep, we have it around here. It grows best in rich organic matter soils, which we have here. Uh, we pick it up because those spores can go airborne when the soil is disturbed. So when you're walking around kicking the soil, you could be putting fungal spores airborne and then you're breathing them in. Uh, that does have a very low infectious dose. You don't need very many of them to get into the body. It can cause a disease. The most common disease is pulmonary blastomycosis. Now, for a lot of individuals, depending on your immune system, it's asymptomatic or a weak infection, a minor cough, and for healthy individuals, goes away on its own. Weaker immune system individuals, uh, especially those that are in the AIDS stage, can suffer uh, respiratory failure, and it could cause death. So I'm like, it's rarer. Again, if you're healthy, it can go away on its own, and symptoms are usually pretty minor. But it can spread through the body. This is showing some of the fungal spores growing in the lungs. Now, it can spread throughout the body, and some can develop cutaneous blastomycosis, where you end up with painless, looks painful, wart-like lesions on your face and upper body. An unfortunate spot to have it happen, but it seems to end up most on your face and your upper body. Again, it happens a lot on the face because that's where you're inhaling those fungal spores. It can also get into the joint tissue and it can spread to the bones. It can cause inflammation in, in that tissue around the joints. That's your osteoarticular blastomycosis and it can get in the nervous system, and it can cause a very deadly meningitis, but usually those that have no working immune system, such as those that are suffering from AIDS. Now, diagnosing it, they again are looking specifically for the yeast form of the fungus, and they can get it from a variety of samples. Kind of depends on what kind of symptoms and issues you're developing, so they can look at your skin scrapings, a sputum sample, look underneath the microscope, and are just looking for the fungus. Treatment, usually given amphotericin B for a good 10 weeks or more, and then you're usually put on a lower dose oral itraconazole for three to six months. It takes a long time to get rid of a fungal disease. It's not like bacteria where seven to 10 days or 10 to 14 days of an anti antibiotic. It's weeks, lots of weeks to lots of months. The third of the true pathogens is the coccidioids, co uh, coccidioids imitis. It causes a disease called coccidiomycosis. Now, some of these are the biggest words, so if you're a person that loves uh, to play Scrabble, I mean, if you got a lot of letters, these are some of the words you can use. Now, we find this particular fungus, it's in the United States, but it's found more in the southwestern United States, northern Mexico. Uh, it likes more of a drier climate. So if you're ever traveling, we don't generally have cases around here, but if you travel, you can definitely pick it up. Now, in it, so again, I always said it's found more in the drier temperatures. We find it in desert soil, rodent burrows, various mine sites. And anytime we've got a dust storm or an earthquake or just people walking or driving vehicles in the deserts, they're gonna kick up those spores and then we inhale them. So we inhale the fungal spore, which is called the arthroconidia, and once it gets into the body, it's gonna germinate and produce these large ferals where those fungi are reproducing, they've got budding, but are all happening in this kind of protective spheral. However, at some point, that can burst open and the fungal spores are gonna to start to spread. Now, Again, because we pick it up through inhalation, pulmonary conditions are usually the main conditions, and you can end up with a cough, chest pain, fever, bloody sputum, 
Again, it can resemble tuberculosis just based on symptoms. If you're more immunocompromised, that's when it usually likes to travel more throughout the body and cause issues throughout the body. It can cause skin issues, which are shown on these pictures. Um, now, diagnosing it, they're gonna look for those spherules. They're a very unique looking structure. It's not just individual spores. They're gonna look for those protective spherules, especially in the lung tissue. They can also do a positive coccidioin skin test. So just like many of you have had to do a TB skin test, they can do a coccidioin skin test. They can look for that reaction. Treatment, amphotericin and B are gold standard antifungal, and that's only if it doesn't go away on its own. For a lot of individuals, it can eventually go away on its own. The fourth of our true pathogen is our Paracoxidioides brasiliensis, which, even a bigger word, can cause a disease known as Paracoxidiomycosis. Huge long word. Now, this particular fungus is found more in southern Mexico and regions of South America, and it is found in Brazil, which is where it gets its name. Farm workers are usually the ones that are most affected by this particular fungus. Now, it's not extremely common, but it is found in soil. So farm workers that are constantly churning up soil, they're exposing themselves, they have that higher risk of picking up the fungus. Now, the disease normally causes pulmonary conditions, a cough, fever, the malaise, or feeling tired, and it usually spreads from the lungs. And it causes an inflammatory disease of your mucous membranes. And so they end up with painful lesions on the tongue, the lips, and the gums for weeks to months. Now diagnosing it, it does have a very unique budding structure. It has this hollow cell where you have multiple buds coming off of the hollow cell. They say it looks like a little steering wheel cell. Now treatment, lots of treatments, itraconazole, ketoconazole, amphotericin B, depending on the severity usually depends on which antifungal that they're going to look at. Now, onto the opportunistic fungi. Now, these generally don't affect healthy individuals. Instead, they're usually going to affect more of those that have a weaker immune system. Now, as we increase the number of AIDS patients, those, have no work, those that have no working immune system, we are now seeing an increase in fungal infections. So as we increase weaker immune system patients, we increase fungal infection in patients. A lot of these are difficult to ID because their symptoms are atypical. They resemble other things. They don't always have the same symptoms. And there are four genera that we routinely encounter in humans. And some of these, you may have heard of these, and some of them you may have actually had as an infection or known someone that's had an infection. So our first one is the pneumocystis, specifically pneumocystis gyrovetsi. It is an obligate intracellular parasite, which means it cannot live on its own. It has to get into the body and live inside of our body. We again pick it up through inhalation. Healthy individuals, generally asymptomatic. Those that have weaker immune systems, especially AIDS patients, we can use it as a diagnostic tool for knowing if someone's in the AIDS stage of an HIV infection. And if left untreated, it can cause enough damage to the lung tissue that it can cause death. Now, how they're gonna diagnose it they can do a chest x-ray, they can stain the fluid that comes from the lungs, and they're going to look specifically for this fungus. Now, it doesn't look like normal fungus because it does grow inside the cyst, and so we can see the fungal spores inside this cyst that's growing in our tissue. Now, treatment, our top drugs to treat it is trimethoprin and sulfanilamide. The interesting part is not amphotericin B. This particular fungus acts more like a parasite, like a protozoan, versus a fungus. It is genetically a fungus, but it acts and behaves more like a parasite. And so we treat it with an antiprotozoan instead of an antifungal. So since it behaves like one, we treat it like one, and it works better than an antifungal drug. 
The second of our opportunistic pathogens is our candida, causes candidiasis, causes a lot of opportunistic infections and diseases because there are a large variety of different candida species out there. Now, one of the most common ones is candida albicans, which is normal flora for many as part of their reproductive and digestive tract. A good 50 plus more percent of individuals have candida albicans as part of the normal flora. Now, depending on where it grows, if it's growing uncontrolled, if it gets somewhere where it's not supposed to be, that's when it causes issues. Now you can pick it up because it is transmitted by contact from one individual to the other. And so preventing it, avoid you know touching in other individuals and it loves a nice warm, moist environment. So wearing clean, dry socks, um, avoiding moist skin, wearing flip-flops and shoes in shared showers are gonna decrease the chance of picking this up. Now, depending on where it ends up, can depend on what, <clears throat> what kind of disease you can suffer from this. Uh, and it also depends on your immune system health. If you're going to be a weaker immune system, it's gonna cause more severe cases. Normally, it only becomes a systemic disease affecting various body systems and those that are com immunocompromised individuals. Again, usually AIDS patients. But anyone can suffer from a candida infection. Again, it's opportunistic, depends where it goes in the body, and it depends on your immune system. Now, this is just to show you some of the different places that it can grow. It can grow in the mouth, it can grow on the skin, diapers, is that warm, moist environment that really promote the growth of this particular fungus. It can get underneath the skin or underneath the nails and cause nail infections. It can grow in the mouth, on the tongue, uh, it's your oral pharyngeal infection, also called thrush. Again, candida can grow in a lot of different places. This is your yeast infection. And I, it can grow in a lot of different places of the body. It just depends on where it goes. And the health of the individual also can affect the severity. Our third opportunistic infection or opportunistic fungi is aspergillus, which causes aspergillosis. Now we again inhale the spores. The spores are usually found in soil. They can be found in food. They can be found in compost, agriculture buildings. It's been known they can end up in air vents, in homes that people can bring it in. And so we pick it up through inhalations and the most common symptom is allergy type symptoms. Kind of sneezing, coughing, watery eyes, runny nose. So a lot of the things where you think you're maybe having allergies to something outside, maybe you're having allergies to something inside because of this particular fungal spore. Now, Mike, it's a unique looking fungus. I'm like, you've got this long stock and the fungal spores <clears throat> are kind of growing off of them <coughs> and getting released as they get to the end. Now, we again, as we breathe it in, it usually causes some type of pulmonary disease. I mean, it can cause basic allergy symptoms, but it can cause pulmonary diseases as well, usually if you have a weaker immune system. The first type of pulmonary disease is called hypersensitivity aspergillosis, and that is more of your just asthma type symptoms. Now, they usually are mild and can go away on your own. However, if you're more immunocompromised, they can be more chronic and they can cause permanent damage to your respiratory system. Non-invasive aspergillomas is when the fungus starts to grow in little balls, these little masses inside your lung tissue, wherever there are empty cavities left over from tuberculosis. So if you've ever had tuberculosis or if a patient's ever had tuberculosis, they do have these empty cavities in their lungs and it's a perfect home for this particular fungus to get in there and grow, especially if weaker immune system. Now, acute invasive as pulmonary aspergillosis means the invasive part is it's gonna spread throughout the lung tissue. It's gonna kill the lung tissue. And the symptoms such as fever, cough, pain when breathing usually resemble pneumonia. Now, again, it can spread throughout the body. 
It can cause a cutaneous aspergillosis, which means you're actually going to have the growth of this particular fungus, usually in little ball-like structures right underneath the skin. And it can cause systemic aspergillosis that usually only, uh, only affects those that have the weakest immune systems, those that are suffering from AIDS or in the AIDS stage of HIV infection, and it can invade different body organs uh, and eventually can lead to death. Now, treatment, depending on where the infection is, depending on what severity level it is, sometimes they're going to remove the infected tissue. Sometimes it might just be asthma-type medications or allergy-type medications. And then they might also give that amphotericin B. The fourth of our true pathogens is Cryptococcus neoformans, causes cryptococcosis. Again, picked up through inhalation. However, this particular fungus is usually tied to bird droppings. So if someone owns a bird, puts them at an increased risk. If they are in a building where there's lots of birds near the roof, and I'm like, they can pick it up. So and I'm like, it's even if, I was gonna say, there's a reason why on, this, on the roof of buildings, a lot of businesses try to prevent birds from landing on the roof. So they don't want birds landing on the roof because that's normally where air intakes are found for buildings. So air conditioning, air intakes, heating air intakes. And if you have birds landing on the roof, you're gonna have bird droppings and they might have the spore in it and they end up right in the air intake. So, you know, there's a couple different ways you can be exposed to it. Now, this particular fungus does have a thick capsule and just like bacteria having a thick capsule, main purpose for it is it resists phagocytosis. So it's harder for our body to get rid of it. Now, primary pulmonary cryptococcus is usually either asymptomatic or you're gonna have symptom of a mild pneumonia, a low fever, a chronic cough, uh, maybe a slight pain when breathing, nothing too bad. And those are usually ones that have a healthier immune system. Those that have weaker immune system, this fungus commonly will travel throughout the body and end up in the, the cerebral spinal fluid and can cause cryptococcal meningitis. And it can cause a very fatal meningitis. Now, it can again travel throughout the body and affect the skin. You can end up with, it's called cutaneous cryptococcosis and you'll end up with these painful ulcer-like ulcer skin lesions that can end up all over the body. Now, as painful as they look, most of the time, depending on immune system, they'll go away on their own. Otherwise, treatments for cryptococcus is normally amphotericin B, um, or we have a few weaker antifungals that they might get as well, depending on immune system, depending on uh, how bad the actual fungal infection is. Now, we've talked a lot about AIDS patients. Well, AIDS patients are most vulnerable to fungal infections because they have a permanent immune dysfunction. Their immune system is not gonna get better. And it's at the time you're at the AIDS stage, you don't have a working efficient immune system. So it's not gonna be able to help at all to get rid of these antifungals. And anti, or to get rid of the fungi and Fungi are hard to get rid of. They require a really strong antifungal to get rid of. And then we're hoping between that long-term antifungal and your immune system, that between the two things that will get rid of it. But if you don't have the working immune system, you're gonna be on antifungals for the rest of your life. Not Even if you don't suffer from a fungal disease, AIDS patients are just put on a low dose antifungal knowing that if they did get a fungal infection, it's very likely going to be what kills them. So those that have HIV, especially if they're getting closer to that AIDS stage of HIV, are usually put on a low-dose antifungal for the rest of their life. But fungal diseases, mycoses, generally cause the most deaths associated with AIDS patients. And some certain fungal infections are going to be what we classify as now someone is in the AIDS stage of HIV infection because only those that have no working immune system are gonna suffer from these unique fungal diseases. 
And we even have now a few new fungal pathogens that are affecting AIDS patients. A fusarium species, a penicillium, different species, the Marnefii, then our penicillin that's used for penicillium that's used to make penicillin, and a trichosporum. So more, more fungal infections that only affect AIDS patients. Now, our last big group of fungal infections are the ones that are on the skin. There are superficial cutaneous and subcutaneous mycoses. They're the most commonly reported fungal diseases. Not because they're the most common fungal disease, but they're the most commonly reported fungal disease. You might be suffering from a fungal infection and you have a mild cough that eventually goes away on its own. You're generally not gonna go in and get diagnosed for the cough. However, if something's growing on your skin, you're gonna be calling that dermatologist ASAP to get seen right away. So they're generally the most commonly reported just because they're a very visual infection. Now, all of them are gonna be opportunistic. They're gonna get somewhere where they're not supposed to be. There's gonna be some type of, uh, I was gonna say, situation that's causing them to grow. Most of them are gonna stay in one spot. They're gonna stay at the site where they were picked up and they're gonna stay generally near the surface of the body. That's why they're called superficial. We usually pick them up or acquire them some type of environmental exposure that we're touching a, in, an infected surface, or these can be spread by direct contact, person to person, because they are right there, those spores right there are on the surface of the skin. Now they're not life-threatening. You may feel like you're gonna die if you have one of these because they can be large, they can be unsightly, but most of them are chronic. It takes a long time for them to go away, and most of them are reoccurring. Once you suffer from one of these fungal infections, you are more likely to have it come back and suffer from it again. Now our first group of our superficial cutaneous, subcutaneous mycoses are their dermophytes. So they, they cause a dermophytoses. These are fungi that grow and feed off of skin, nails, and hair. Now, some of the most common derma dermatophytes are trichophyton, microsporum, and ep epidermophyton. These are our top dermatophyte genera. Uh, one particular disease that they can cause is something known as tinea. It's more commonly called ringworm. It's a disease that the fungus is growing on the skin, and as your immune system is recognizing this fungus growing on the skin, it's feeding off your skin, you're gonna have an inflammation. Now, the inflammation usually resembles a red ring, and at one point, they thought it resembled what looked like a worm growing underneath your skin, so it has stuck that it's called ringworm. There is no worm whatsoever involved in ringworm. Uh, instead, it's just a fungal infection. It just kind of spreads outward to form that ring-like surface, and you just have an immune system reaction to it. Now, when they're feeding off of your skin, nails, and hair, it's because in that tissue, there is a protein called keratin, and that's the nutrient that it's feeding off of. Now, because your immune system can react to it, that's when you can get that inflammation and that inflammatory response could actually damage more tissue. So the fungus is growing on tissue and your immune system can be damaged by tissue. It is one that's commonly spread by person-to-person -person contact and wrestlers with their person-to-person -person contact and it loves warm, moist environments. And when wrestlers are sweaty in the sweaty mats, it provides that perfect warm, moist environment. And so a lot of dermatophytes are very commonly linked to wrestling as a sport in general. Another skin infection is called Malesia, and specifically the Malesia furfur, which I just like the name. For a lot of individuals, it's part of the normal skin flora. However, if this particular fungus starts to grow uncontrolled, it causes a condition known as pityriasis, which is a depigmentation or a hyperpigmentation of your skin. Now, this particular fungus interferes with melanin production, which is why it's affecting the pigmentation of the skin. And it usually happens in little patches. Now, when it causes a depigmentation, which is more common than hyperpigmentation, normally, again, for a lot of individuals, part of your normal skin flora, 
This usually is more diagnosed in the summer. Main reason, as your skin starts to tan, that's when you start to see this depigmentation of certain areas. You don't have a nice even tan because this particular fungus, for a lot of individuals, it's part of your normal skin flora, is causing depigmentation in patches all over your skin. Now, diagnosing it, they can do a skin scraping. They're going to look for that budding yeast and some of the little short hyphae, the little strands where the yeast is coming, the yeast spores are coming off of. For treating it, a superficial infection, sometimes they'll do a topical antifungal. If it looks like it's spreading, it's a little worse of an infection, they'll give you an oral antifungal as well. Problem is, even if you get rid of it, it was probably part of your normal skin flora, so it's gonna come right back. So it's really hard to get rid of permanently. Here's some of the little short strand hyphae with little fungal spores on them. Now, our next of our skin infections is the sporothrix shankii. Now, most commonly affects the arms and legs. This particular fungus is found in soil, really likes warm, moist areas in the United States, and it is usually found in soil related to plant material. Now, how it gets in the body is it usually gets in through open wounds, so it's generally not picked up through inhalation as most of these are. Instead, it's usually introduced by some type of thorn prick or a wood splinter, that can happen with a lot of gardeners or farmers. Now, the disease is gonna cause lesions at the infection sites. So wherever the spore got into the body at that infection site, at that cut, at that prick, you're usually gonna have lesions. But then it does like to get into the lymphatic system and it travels along the lymphatic system and it causes secondary lesions along the lymphatic vessels. So you're actually gonna see these lesions form in lines so that's the lymphatic vessel that's right underneath the skin that's right there. And you're gonna get these secondary lesions that are gonna form along there. Now, this particular fungus is usually tied to individuals, farmers, gardeners, that grow a lot of roses. Roses have those thorns that provide that opening. And because the fungus really likes a plant material and soil with plant material, it's the perfect place for it to grow and the perfect way for the fungus to get in the body with all of those little pricks from the thorns. Now diagnosing it, they can do a skin scraping at the infection, that original lesion site. They're gonna look for that dimorphic fungi. They can look for various types of clinical signs. They can look at the skin. Uh, it's still treatable. It's you're on some type of topical antifungal, usually for several months. If it's not going away, it becomes more extensive. Maybe you have a weaker immune system. They'll put you on an oral itraconazole. Best way to not get it? Well, if you know you might possibly getting pricked when you're working in soil, wear gloves, wear long clothing, make sure you've got shoes on, things like that. Now, we did talk a little bit about how fungi can cause allergies. And yes, many of you may suffer from allergies or seasonal allergies. There are lots of things out there. Allergies really are as your immune system is overly sensitive to something. Well, it could be overly sensitive to some of these fungal spores as well. About three to 10% of humans are affected by allergies related to fungal spores. Now a type one hypersensitivity, which is most common, is you're gonna have asthma-like symptoms, you may have eczema as your allergic reaction, or you may have the hay fever symptoms, the watery eyes, the runny nose. I'm like, that again is just, it's your immune system's over sensitivity to these fungal spores that you breathed in or got into the body. However, there are, it's rare, but it can happen that individuals can suffer from an immune complex or type three hypersensitive. Again, less common, but this can happen when you have a chronic inhalation of certain fungal spores. It's more common farmers that are constantly churning up soil and breathing in and exposing themselves to fungal spores. But this is when you're gonna have not just an oversensitivity to these fungal spores, it's a huge immune system reaction. This is when you can have an anaphylactic shock type of response. 
again, it's rare that that happens, and it's normally those that just have this chronic inhalation of these different fungal allergens. Now, our last, last group, I just have two slides, are what about all the fungi that you could eat that could be harmful? We talked about a lot of fungal diseases that you inhale, they get under the, you know, under the skin, but what about certain fungus that can cause death because you eat them? So these are fungi that are gonna cause poisoning because you ate them. So one, one of them is called Ammonita phylloids. It's known as the death cap mushroom. And if you eat this particular fungus, uh, it can cause liver failure and death. So don't eat that. Now, symptom that you may have eaten one of those, within about two days after eating it, you're usually gonna have bloody diarrhea, convulsions, and then death within a couple days. So I usually say don't eat any mushrooms out there unless you know what they are, because I kind of like the saying, all mushrooms are edible, some only once. Another fungus that's common, luckily I haven't seen a lot of cases around here, it's called, it's the Gymonetra esculenta, it's the false morel. Now we have morels around here. Spring is the perfect time to go morel hunting. Now a normal morel, I'm like, it's normally kind of a tan color. It's got all of this variegation in it. And if you open it up, it's very hollow on the inside. It's like completely empty, weighs almost nothing. A false morel is normally gonna be a darker color, or orangish reddish colored, but it still has kind of that variegated look to it. But when you open it up, completely solid on the inside. Now, if you ate one of these, it also can cause bloody diarrhea, convulsions, and death within days. So don't eat one of those. Again, the morels around here, it's pretty rare. I've seen these. You just wanna make sure it has that tan, whitish color to it, and it's hollow on the inside. The last, not the total last, but the last of the deadly mushrooms is the Cortinarius gentilis, it's little brown mushrooms. Some of the initial symptoms, it's gonna be thirst, nausea, and then complete liver and kidney failure. And that's what eventually is going to kill you. Again, very deadly mushrooms. Now, a couple other mushrooms that can still cause issues. They generally don't cause death, but they can still cause issues and mushroom poisoning. These two mushrooms, uh, the Psilocybe cubensis, little brown mushroom, and the Ammonita muscaria, it's a white mushroom with a red cap with little white spots all over it. These are hallucinogenic mushrooms, but if taken in large quantities, especially in children, they can cause uh, convulsions in children. Now, treatment, normally they're gonna try to induce vomiting to try to get that mushroom and the toxins that are in it out of the body. Sometimes they do charcoal to try to absorb some of the toxins, but some of them can cause permanent damage to the liver as well if taken in large quantities, depending on the age of the individual. Now, normally these mushrooms are known. They produce hallucinations. These are the mushrooms when people talk about shrooms. These are those mushrooms that can cause those hallucinations. Interesting little factoid to leave off though, as this is my last slide. This particular mushroom, the one that's got a red cap with white spots all over, because it can cause hallucination, kind of the story goes that someone was eating this particular mushroom, was hallucinating, and saw a man, large man, wearing a lot of red with white trim on it. Now, if you can think of what large man wears a lot of red with white trim on it, especially in the winter, Christmas time, kind of the theory goes, Santa came from someone that was shrooming on this particular mushroom. Now, you're gonna start to see this mushroom is associated with Christmas because of that. There are lots of signs of this mushroom at Christmas. So take a look over the Christmas season that you might see a lot of this individual mushroom. You can even get this ornaments of this mushroom. So it's, it's out there. I'm like, I've got a little article on Blackboard too that shows all the similarities on where Santa came from. And it might be because of this particular mushroom. So we'll end right there on that random factoid for you.